Hey guys, um, I hope everything is working. It's a pleasure to finally be connected to you. My name is Otto Bertalan Meshko, the medical futurist, and you really can't imagine how much it means to me that now, from now on, uh, we can have these live Q&As. This is the first The Medical Futurist live Q&A, and we plan to host many others. Normally, what I do is I meet a lot of people through events and conferences. I travel around the world every year. I go to about 60, 70 places per year and I meet thousands of people so I can have really good discussions after my keynotes or during the breaks. But as, as this is gone for at least a year from now on, um, I plan to do this and have these live Q and A's with you. What we do at The Medical Futurist is that we are trying to provide context around digital health technologies. We are trying to help governments, uh, regulatory agencies, patients, medical professionals, even researchers and developers understand what's going on, why digital health is a cultural transformation, which technologies can be helpful and how those can be helpful. And the truth is that for many years, for almost a decade, we have been talking about like a science fiction movie, that these technologies are coming and, and from 3D printing to artificial intelligence will change how we provide care, how we practice medicine. And because of the pandemic, what changed though now is that we are living in a documentary where our job is not providing a vision anymore only, but more like helping people understand how to use those technologies in action. We've been talking about telemedicine, for example, for over a decade, why it's the only sustainable method for filling the gap between the medical professionals that are missing from healthcare systems worldwide and a growing number of patients. And now you see telemedicine is the new norm and people around the world have to first call in describing their symptoms and they have to use live video chats with their doctors. So that's that's where we are trying to be helpful. At the Medical Futurist Institute, we do the same, but through peer-reviewed research. We publish papers and studies about artificial intelligence, its future role in medicine, and many other issues related to digital health. So the plan for today is that in the next um, 56 minutes or so, uh, I will try to answer all the questions that you might have uh, through YouTube. You can leave a, a comment in the chat and I will do my best with the best of my knowledge to answer all those questions. I will try to be as specific as possible. Um, so please feel free to challenge me uh, about any medical healthcare technology, high level concepts or real life examples. It really, artificial intelligence is far my favorite topic and that's the area where I spend most of my time um, dedicated to, but also digital health technologies. I've, I've reviewed about 150 digital health sensors from sleep trackers to genetic tests and microbiome tests. So I'm happy to answer questions about those two. Also, the Medical Futurist team is here with us on the chat. And whenever you have a question for which we already have analysis, an article, a video published on our channels, then they will share those links with you. One more thing, when we ask people to register through Eventbrite for this event, we ask them that if you want to ask a question in advance, please feel free to do that. And we received over 300 questions and not questions like, what is the future like for healthcare, but really detailed in-depth questions from the future of primary care to how artificial intelligence could be really practical, how governments and countries are trying to tackle the regulation of advanced technological devices. So really amazing stuff. And the plan is that, of course, that's a live Q&A. So I will try to answer the, the questions on the YouTube chat first. But in the meantime, and in the breaks, I will try to answer as many questions that were sent to us before as possible. But I promise you that I will make sure to answer each and every one of those questions that you've sent before. I'm not saying that by tomorrow, but in a week or so, I will send you an email with, with an answer to the question, with links and additional materials. So um, I can't wait to jump right into it. And um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, I hope everything technically is going fine. We have been talking with plenty of gamer streamers for a while, so we are trying to learn from them. It's a new way. It's a new field for us too, but we are doing our best. So um, Hector Perez uh, is asking a great question. Let me show this to you. So what do you think? Mm. Oh, I, I will get better at this. Here it is. So what do you think are the major challenges for the future of health in terms of technology? That's Hector Perez, thank you so much for this great question. It's really a high level question. Um, 
I think most people would expect me to say that things like affordability and, and the regulations, but I think far the most important challenge is patient empowerment and why and how patients have been the most underused resources in healthcare. And I really mean it. I think patient empowerment is the biggest milestone in the history of healthcare. And I'm, I'm saying this going back to the time of Hippocrates 2000 years ago. This is this cultural transformation of how patients are becoming empowered, how they are being engaged in the decision-making process about their health and disease, how they are bringing value and data to the table, that's far more important and a bigger, bigger challenge than which microchip comes out next year. And then of course uh, comes the, the list of other challenges from, from privacy, that now we have to give up some of our privacy in exchange for a chance for a longer and healthier life through these technologies. Regulations represent a huge issue, and we know that the FDA in the US, the Food and Drug Administration, has been showing a great example of how to regulate not just individual technologies, but even companies that can provide software updates for an AI-based technology every day or so. And of course, traditional methods cannot regulate those, but if you regulate a company and you allow them to keep on coming up with, with updates, then it's a different scenario. So I think these three issues uh, are the most important ones to start with. So thank you, Hector Perez, for your question. Um, wow, Mihail, it's, it's great to see you again in this live chat. And Mihail is asking a very interesting question uh, about omics, which uh, is like a group term for everything related to the system level of biologics and the biological background that we have. And she, she asked specifically about genomics, proteomics, metabolics. The, the level, the list of levels of omics is getting really huge. But I think what matters here is what kind of omics data we individual patients can get access to. And the, the obvious one here is genomics. Now it's really easy to get the whole genome sequencing service in a direct to consumer way. And there are hundreds of simpler genetic tests out there. I've tried about seven. I've learned a lot of things, um, some clinically important things such as what medications I would have a sensitivity for, which is crucial information. I learned what conditions I have a risk for. So with my GP, we could design a preventive plan. I learned some clinically useless stuff, such as if I eat asparagus, I can smell it in my urine. It's a superpower that one third of us can experience. And if you experience it, you know what I'm talking about here. Um, but of course, I'd like to focus on the clinically useful results from these tests. Uh, the microbiome is a different omics level. I had a microbiome test from home, so I learned more about the what kind of uh, microbiome, what kind of uh, uh, microbes live in my digestive system. And as those that, that microbiome that you have impacts your, your diet, even your depression levels, it, it, it gives you some information um, about what you can expect and how you should adjust your diet based on that. That's, I think, a very most help, uh, the most helped me to, to reform my diet based on my microbiome. And then uh, we are just coming up with an article this week on medicalfutures.com about at-home lab tests because those can give you plenty of information about your metabolome and glycomes, everything you need to, to get a better sense of how to manage your health or disease. Of course, not alone yourself, but with the help of your medical professional. So even though I've been able to measure all these things, uh, I, still, I still share the data with my, my primary care physician. And I think we form a great team with Dr. Reka Vernes uh, about designing a preventive plan for the future of my health. So Mihailas, thank you again uh, for this great question. Um, thank you for the great questions. It's, it's enough if you send a question just once. The all-rounder bro, thank you for the question about the radical life expansion. I, this, is, this is a topic that a lot of people are interested in and I get this question very often. And um, I do understand that the reasoning behind the question and the, the interest in this topic, but I still believe that we have so many other issues to solve because before we can focus on living really long life, before we can really extend uh, and, and, and focus on longevity, that I like to focus on these practical things first, such as let's just give, give most people a chance to live a long and healthy life. And not even, I'm not even thinking about here living more than 100 years. I'm just thinking about giving people the chance for access to care because 1 billion people don't have it. But answering your question, um, 
the, the, the kind of biotechnological research that has been going on focusing on longevity has skyrocketed in the last decade or so. Uh, with, the, with the lead of uh, Aubrey de Grey and his colleagues, it's quite clear that uh, the, the, the basic research behind understanding what aging really means and whether if it's a condition that we can treat like many other medical conditions, I think it's really progressing fast. So in, in the 2020s, we can really expect without saying any big words, um, breakthroughs about aging diseases. I'm not sure if you'll find treatments for those in the next decade or so, but in the 2020s, I think this research, this this area of research might have a golden age uh, because of the, the past efforts we've been seeing over the last decade. So thank you for this question. Um, what is the actual status of the legislation in the US and in the EU? Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to try to dive into that, but if you could be a bit more specific, I would love to address uh, the, the question being a bit more specific. Matteo Villa asked me how a pharma company can really catch the value of, of digital therapeutics. Let me show this question to you. almost fits on the screen, why they are still doing revenues on selling drugs. Excellent question, um, Matteo. Um, I've been working with, I think, top 20 pharma companies in the last 12, 13 years, uh, being a speaker and a consultant. So I meet many of them and on the high level, on the C-level of those companies, I have discussions with them because I have nothing to lose. So I can be as honest with them as possible. I don't think that the selling drug component will, will get vanished anytime soon, but I do think that, and I, tell them this, that selling drugs will not be enough anymore. By this, I mean that selling drugs without a digital health component, like part of a package, will be the jackpot approach that healthcare providers and payers are looking for here. And we've seen examples about this already. In, in um, about two years ago, the French company Roche acquired an Austrian diabetes startup called uh, MySugar. And for me, that's that's the best example of what a pharma company needs to do to provide something more by providing the, the medication that they have. It doesn't matter how innovative that medication is. But they thought that by providing their diabetes medication and by adding a digital health app to the medication, they can improve compliance. And they did. And for providers, it was a, a more attractive option like in this package than the other options from other companies just selling the drugs. So I think... I think the future of pharma, especially about digital health, lies in that section uh, of the field of technologies that they, they need to understand that they have to, pro they have to assign a digital health component to whatever product or service they are trying to, to offer. So Matteo, thank you so much for your question. Uh, Zoltan, Shadeid Zoltan had a wonderful question about how regulations and legislation should catch up with the explosion of AI technologies. You, you poke the monster here. Uh, that's one of my favorite topics. Uh, let me share this question with you. Okay, I'm almost there. Uh, at the end of the question, how would you handle the, the medical ethical framework? Wow, there's two big questions. Let's start with the first one. My favorite example is about this, about how AI should be regulated is coming from the FDA. The way um, they have been trying to lead this movement and um, create the first legislations about how to assess the quality of a medical device that is based on artificial intelligence has been exemplary. Actually, the, the infographics you can see behind me uh, we published it before and there is a paper coming out quite soon about this. We were the first ones to assess the list of all the FDA approved medical technologies that that are based on artificial intelligence. And only the FDA has such a list. I mean, they don't have a list. We had to make that list ourselves, but only the FDA has been approving medical technologies that have either artificial intelligence or machine learning, deep learning, deep neural networks, these expressions mentioned in the official announcement. There are only a handful of these algorithms so far, 30 something, but we will publish more than 70 because we think the others are AI based too, but the FDA announcement didn't contain the expression. So now we are pushing the FDA to, to lead this movement too, 
in assessing which technology is AI related and when it is, how to approve it, how to approve it properly. But for still in this, they are the, the best examples. And the way they now, as I mentioned before, focus on regulating companies that can come up with further updates later on, instead of the traditional format, regulating individual technologies, like individual software updates, well, this is the, the right uh, solution. So, so they are leading this space uh, quite well. About the medical ethical framework, I guess I know what you're referring to. What happens when um, a, med a physician makes a decision based on an AI-based technology and the decision is wrong and it, it does harm to the patient? Uh, I think for now, the general bioethical um, consensus is that if you make a decision based on any technology that you are using and that's a wrong decision, then it's your responsibility as a medical professional. If you use a technology as it was described in the official announcement or description, so if I use a stethoscope on you and I listen to your cardiac sounds, I, I make a decision based on that, which is a bad decision. So you, I do you harm, that's of, co that, that's of course my responsibility. If I do the same with an AI-based technology, I say no difference here. But if I use technology in a different way than it is supposed to be used, then it comes down to me. That's the, the bioethical consensus for now. So Zoltan, thank you again for your question. Well, I'm trying to catch up with all of you. Um, wow, Banu Bilen, it's the, the, I love the question because it even makes me talk a little bit about the long-term future. So how could quantum computing help us with the current COVID pandemic? Well, um, first we did a video about quantum computing which we really enjoy doing. Um, and we try to envision a world in which quantum computing is a practical technology and, and it can help people analyze really vast amounts of data. So in this case, where I think it could help is twofold. One, trying to predict next outbreaks the way the Canadian startup Blue Dot did uh, before WHO issued the first warning. I guess you know the story by now, this Canadian startup issued the actual first report that a potential outbreak is imminent in China. It was not coming from a, a CDC or a major medical organization. It came from a Canadian startup looking at data from CDC, uh, country-based CDCs, and also uh, airline ticketing data. So I think I can imagine quantum computing really being helpful in this analyzing even more data from GPS to Bluetooth, like the way the contract tracing apps are working, um, without breaching our privacy. It's so like turning to blockchain for trying to anonymizing patient data, but still getting lots of it. And the second is analyzing the data we already have, not in predicting outbreaks, but in um, triaging patients. So when, when you can decide based on just the pure data that is flowing into your medical system that this, there's a patient influx, but that patient requires medical help right away without even a medical professional or nurse going there, analyzing, examining him or her, that would be extremely helpful. Because then even with reduced healthcare capacity, we could make sure we deliver the, you know, the ventilators, ICU support, whatever equipment they need to those patients who have a short time frame where we can still help them. So I think in these two areas quantum computing would be amazing but if you watch the video you will see that you know dozens of more areas where quantum computing could do wonders even though we still have to wait a decade or so for quantum computing to be a practical reality so thank you banu for the question uh, yano labs asked the question about the aura ring um, let me share this the question with you Yes, I've heard about the Oura Ring and I know actually I, plenty of people have been sell, sell, sending this to me because they, they thought I should also analyze it and review it uh, for medicalfutures.com. The only reason I, I haven't done it already is that I cannot imagine wearing a, a quite huge ring um, all day, every day. Um, I use my Fitbit smartwatch. I've been wearing this for three years, day and night. I only take it off when I go to shower and it, I, I could still wear it while having a shower, but I don't do that. But having this this quite big Oura ring doesn't sound or, or look too comfortable to me, but I, I think the only way to find out would be to, to test it myself. So we will try to jump right into it. We have quite a back, backlog right now with some devices. Like right now on my table, there is a portable ultrasound device from Clarius. 
it's quite mind blowing that you can do now an ultrasound imaging examination with your smartphone right away. Um, and it's not, I, I think it's not AI based yet. So it doesn't give you instructions how to do a proper examination. It just lets you do the examination and then share the video or, or the, 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 the image with a professional or peer later on. But you know, th these are the kinds of technologies we are testing every day. So we have quite a backlog and it's an exci exciting process, but I will have to dive into uh, checking the Oura ring. So thank you for the, the question about that. Wow, Madison. What a question it is. Let me share it with all of you. So what advice would you give next generation medical students to be prepared and thrive in the future of health? Wow. For 10 years, I've been teaching medical students at Semmelweis Medical School. This is one of the best parts of my life that I enjoy the most. And um, I, I, I have designed a curriculum for medical students who want to understand what digital health means and how to work with artificial intelligence, how to prepare them for the future. And there are a few basic things that I think every medical student should do. Number one is that they have to read a lot about why digital health is a cultural transformation. It's not about them. It's not about microchips. It's about patient empowerment. If they understand this basic concept of the future of healthcare, they will understand everything else. The second is medical students of the next generation need digital literacy. They have to feel like they are at home in the jungle of digital data and digital information. This, this space that we are living in right now, this must be their, their home, their, their actual home. Three, um, I think medical students need to have a, a sort of forecasting skill set. By this, I mean that the word they will start working in will not, be a, will not be a word where they will be told what to do and how to use technologies, but they will have to be the ones who make their own assumptions. For this, what I'm trying to do in my course is that I ask medical students, it's actually part of the exam, I ask medical students to, to write science fiction short stories. Also, I ask them to write um, a newspaper article from 2035 about the medical technology going berserk. So I make them really think about the future in a way that they have to bring those ideas down to a practical reality, they have to write those things down. Because this way they start playing with the what if question. And the more they play with the what if question, what if a technology becomes a great solution? What if a technology goes becomes a nightmare scenario? The what if question gradually helps them prepare for whatever is coming next. There are many other things and you can find an article about this on medicalfutures.com, but these are the three things I would focus on if I could be a medical student again, a first year medical student right away. So Madison, thank you very much. And I guess based on the question, good luck to you. Um, Vajid Mirza asks about the SIO molecular sensor that could be helpful for doctors. Well, a bit of a background for those who don't, who don't know about SIO. A few years ago, there was a crowdfunding campaign about a device that just by scanning something could describe the, the molecular content of, of that object. Uh, if it's glass or water, if it's a food, what kind of, you know, how many carbohydrates the food contains, stuff like that. And while the company has been claiming they are able to do so, we haven't really seen good pr proofs yet. And I've heard plenty of complaints from people who who participated in the first crowdfunding campaign that they haven't even received a device, stuff like that. I don't know because I haven't tested them yet, but I I, I need to see proof in peer-reviewed papers before I believe anything such a device can do. But answering your question, yes, I think it could be useful for dietitians, nutritional specialists, by being able to describe what exactly the food on the plate contains in terms of nutrients, um, and they could help their patients even more based on that. So thank you for the question. Okay, Rich Prest has a great question and a long one, which I will try to take a, make a bit uh, shorter in a second. Maybe this way. It's about the act that do you see the same potential for pharma to add the, the access to the right food for them uh, to their prescribed therapies to improve outcomes. I guess you're prefer referring to somehow nutrigenomics and the way we could use additional data from genomic uh, sequence, genome sequencing or any other healthcare parameters when trying to determine what kind of food your diet should contain. Well, I, I 
think it's an, quite an obvious additional benefit to anyone's lifestyle. I'm just I'm just not sure that it it would work well coming from pharma companies being assigned to the therapies that that are coming from those pharma companies. I think uh, medical professionals have to be knowledgeable about this and and especially primary care physicians, and they can help with that. And I'm, I have no doubts that services will come that want to get access to my genomic data and based on that, maybe even my microbiome data. And based on those, they will provide me with some dietary insights and suggestions. I, I'm quite looking forward to testing the first one of this kind. Habit might be a company that has been doing that, but I, I haven't seen proof uh, myself. Um, so maybe that it should it would be better if it comes from from medical professionals, not pharma company. But that's just my personal opinion. All right, thank you so much for the many questions. It's it's really exciting, and I'm trying to to get through all of them. Um, here's a question from Marta Mentacinkotsky. Again, quite a long question that I'm trying to make shorter a bit. So. At the university, which biomedical science part could be exciting? <laughs> I'm coming from life sciences. I At the age of six, I knew that I would devote my life to, to life sciences. Um, if I had to choose one, that would be clinical genomics. But, you know, I spent half of my lifetime in that. Um, every area under lifestyle, life sciences, is exciting. Um, but if really I had to choose some because of my technological background, I would go with biomedical and biomechanical engineering because that combines di really different aspects of the healthcare field, the engineering part, as well as some technological healthcare medical related components, plus the medical professional uh, perspectives into one really exciting subject or future profession. So I, I guess that would be biomedical engineering. Um, okay. Srikar K asked about telemedicine. It's It was under underutilized until COVID pandemic in most parts of the world. Is it the right time to explore the potential of telesurgical solutions? And could you share the future about this space? Um, you would not believe me, but about an hour ago, we just uh, recorded a video about why telemedicine is the new norm and why we have to get used to it. So I don't think it's just time to, to discover the, the options about telemedicine. I think it's time to, to get used to it, to understand that you it, getting access to a physician in person with really every minor health problem you have is a luxury. And what awaits us is that um, we can get access to medical care, but for the first line will be about some sort of technologies like a first triage, like a chatbot that makes sure that the problem you have really needs to be seen by a medical professional. But telesurgical tele solutions, a different part, different aspect of this. And I think it's not the, the pandemic that could bring light on this topic, but the introduction of 5G. Because for telemedical surgeries, you really need to make sure that the connection is amazing. And 4G is not amazing, it's great. 5G is amazing. You cannot have connectivity issues and you cannot deal with legs like in streaming videos like this one when dealing with a patient on the on the table in the operating room. So, so I think 5G could be the breakthrough for those uh, telesurgeries, not the, the pandemic itself. Uh, all right, I, I'm sorry, there are great questions and many of those. Um, I will skip those that I at least address partially, like quantum computing. Um, the aura ring. Dr. Tebes, nice to see you here. And there's a great, great question about digital biomarkers. Um, for those who are not familiar with biomarkers, that the whole area of life sciences, biomedical research, and even the drug um, research is based on the idea that we can have a large amount of patients and we can give a therapy to some of them and placebo to others. And based on a few biomarkers we can uh, we can measure and detect about them, we can make informed decisions whether a treatment works or not, whether the process, uh, a diagnostic solution is, is good enough or not to be implemented into the practice of medicine. The, the, the word of digital health introduced digital biomarkers about 10 years ago when it, it 
became clear that with our smartphones in our pockets and hands, with some basic health sensors and, you know, ECG devices at home, uh, portable diagnostic devices that can measure blood pressure, body temperature, heart rate, oxygen saturation, many other things, we could detect these data, these health parameters, and we could share those even live during the virtual clinical trial is a mind-blowing breakthrough. So what we've seen with the Apple Watch using the ECG function and, ha and having a, a real life virtual um, clinical trial going on. So, so those doing the trial can look at live data on their dashboards and make decisions on the go. This is really exciting. So before it took six months or even more, even a year to detect and obtain and collect all the data from patients, from the different healthcare institutions. And then at some, at one place, they would analyze those and make decisions, not on the go, but you know, a year later, but now it's live. And that's, that's why digital biomarkers is such an exciting field. And also that's why we have to be very cautious with which ones we put, we bring to the level of evidence. Otherwise, um, there are many things we can measure and obtain about the human body with smartphones and these gadgets at home, but not many of these could be used in, in virtual clinical trials. So the, the evidence threshold has to be really high here. And I think regular agents are doing a great job in ensuring that only good digital biomarkers are being used for medical decisions later on. So thank you for the question. Andras Kusegi, uh, it's, a, it's a weird question, but it's a really exciting topic, so I need to address this the future of toilets. Um, so how realistic is the idea of future toilets will be analyzing human health by pee or poo? Uh, <laughs> well, um, I should say that there are sporadic examples with some technologies that are not in action, not in practice, but have been shown to be able to analyze urine, for example, through a microchip. Uh, I think the company MC10 did something like this uh, back then. And um, stool samples could be analyzed too. But there is an example uh, coming from about a month ago from, from the University of Stanford, where they really published a, a big high level paper, I think in Nature, about a smart toilet that can do such analysis on urine and stool samples. So um, uh, it, can even, it could even um, take pictures of you and recognize you um, based on the signature it sees below. The best joke I had that time was that it would be really weird seeing flashlights coming out from, from below. I'm sorry for the um, smelly uh, joke here, but that I, I would say that's a you know, funny technology, but it was published in a high level prestigious medical journal. So even maybe that might even become a possibility, a realistic possibility to be used in practice. So thank you for the question. Um, okay, there are really amazing questions. I'm trying to get hold of all the ones I haven't covered before. Uh, Yon Labs asking about whether he should do a microbiome test. Um, absolutely. Just let me share the question with everybody else. Here it is. So you should, I think it, anything that gives me information that is based on science is useful for me. Um, when you get the microbiome test results, don't expect to see something life-changing. Maybe you will learn more about what kind of food types you should consume more or less. I learned what kind of things I'm more or less sensitive to. So I, I, it helped refine my diet, but I wouldn't say that it can be compared to the results of a whole genome sequencing service. That's really top of the field and the microbiome test is just something interesting we can do, but don't expect the same kind of level of data you can get from these tests. All right, Ted Townsend asked a, a really long question, which I won't be able to, to shorten enough to fit the screen, but maybe this way. There's a lot of discussion about virtual consultations with either GPs or consultants, but what will be the impact on how hospitals operate? I think there is there are many things that will certainly stay with us after the pandemic or even during the pandemic for the next year or so. Masks, social distancing, and the general fear from patients about being exposed to the chance of getting infected. 
I think because of these reasons, many patients will just try to avoid going to the doctor with not major health problems. So for them, from them, the demand will keep on being high for virtual consultations. And I think this certainly changes the way hospitals are structured because usually you, the way you, you as a professional, you make a professional, you go into work, you're not supposed to be spending half of your time sitting next to your smartphone or computer answering, answering questions virtually, but doing your job in person. But maybe that's the kind of new work structure that physicians will have to get adjusted to, that at least one third of their time will be spent doing virtual visits. Um, I, I do believe that it's demanding to answer questions this way, but you can get used to it. And I think it might lead to less, um, a less overburdened healthcare system uh, physicians not burning out so much because of the demand and the and the weight on their shoulders that they have to bear with, uh, because virtual consultations create a different um, situation with patients, and they could make sure that those patients who need to be seen in person they could still ask them to come in. But I think the reward system, so you you help a patient, you get a reward that it works, is quite fast through virtual consultations. Live patients have to wait. So they, they come into the, the in-person visit with a different mindset. Maybe they have been waiting for hours before that. So it's a different thing, but, but virtual visits could be a fast conversation type thing. And it might even help alleviate the, the burden that physicians have to face. Maybe I'm too optimistic here, but we will see because many um, healthcare institutions have been facing surges in numbers. Uh, like I've seen like a growth of 600% in, in teleconsultations. So either they like it or not, medical professionals will, will have to try to find a new system in this and, and get adjusted to the situation. Gerald Tong asks an, an interesting question, whether any life extension technology be available to the masses during this decade. I think you will hate me for my answer because you, I think you expected me to cover something else. But yes, absolutely. Patient empowerment is the best life extension tool in the, on the planet. The fact that I should be engaged with medical decisions around my about my health and disease, that I should measure things and, and contribute to the discussions, the way I could get engaged with in the medical team, which also contains of my, my peers, my patient peers, my family, the medical professionals around me, only patient empowerment, I think, the patient empowerment alone is the greatest life extension tool ever because it comes with the use of health sensors and ECGs. So if you have a stroke risk, you have no idea about because there is no symptom that you could experience. But doing an ECG with this, a six channel ECG, you could find out if you have a, a, a stroke risk like a, for pulmonary embolism um, based on atrial fibrillation. Then you can go to the doctor saying that, well, I had this risk. We had patient stories like this published on medicalfutures.com and on our channels. Then this is the greatest advantage ever. And I'm not even talking about getting drugs in the future that might extend your life. Just being in, involved in the conversation, contributing with your data and getting access to your own data alone. This package is the greatest life extension tool that you've seen before. So absolutely, this will become available, available to the masses. Um, Hector Perez asked a great question about telemedicine. Let me share it with you. Whether there are medical specialties where it's not possible to, to let them take part in, um, in telemedicine. Uh, um, unfortunately, that's the case. There are medical specialties where we, we made a, an infographic available for free, where we analyzed um, every medical specialty based on uh, two axes. One was about how creative versus how repetitive the job is. And one was about how conversation-based versus data-based the specialty is. So those specialties, which are very conversation-based and very creative, every patient case is different. In those cases, telemedicine is, all, is almost uh, an, um, a mission impossible, psychiatry, emergency medicine. In those cases where it could be date, more data-based and it's kind of repetitive, like dermatology, um, sometimes ophthalmology, telemedicine could thrive. 
So there is a there is a threshold, I guess, we can draw here, but we will share the the infographic with you. I think that's the best kind of effort I can have here trying to answer this question by sharing that infographic with you. So thank you for for the question. All right. Yono Labs has a third question. I, I love the questions flowing in, and I haven't even had a chance to look at the questions that were sent be to us before. She asked, he asked about, uh, I recommended using ECG regularly at home. I'm not saying you should use it regularly, and I have no medical evidence for that. I think Cardia, the device I'm recommending to you, they have been involved in about 20 studies trying to find out if it makes sense for certain groups of patients with some risk to get um, um, to, to, for the ECG to be measured regularly, but I tested many. Um, I have to recommend you the technology and the company that has the biggest number of medical studies in the background, not financed by them. I think that's the holy grail of, of medical device recommendations. That's Cardia. They have a whole evolution of ECG devices and it's it works brilliantly well. Um, I think it's affordable. It even gives you an analysis after the, the testing is done with the AI-based algorithm. And again, they have many studies in the background. So if I had to suggest any device, any company, I would suggest Cardia. Just mentioning that whenever I suggest you any technologies or companies, we never accept any sponsorship, any kind of payment. Um, I don't have stocks in any of these companies, unfortunately. None of these. We, If we like something, we say it out loud. If we don't like something, we say that out loud either. So that, that's how the medical futurist tries to give you a an objective view about digital health technologies. Um, Theodora Niegu just sent a great question about what three books would you recommend to us? It's not a fair question asking this to a science fiction fan, but I guess you are referring to not you non-fiction books, not fiction books. Non-fiction books, um, I think. A great one is obviously actually anything from Eric Topol. It's quite an obvious first choice. Uh, the patient will see you now. Um, the creative destruction of medicine um, and his newest one, Deep Deep Medicine, are wonderful books for anyone diving into the future of digital health. I love the book um, Rebooting AI. It's about understanding the basic concepts about artificial intelligence. Um, I love the Digital Doctor from Bob Vector. And I also published a list of these nonfiction books about digital health on um, medicalfuturist.com. So you are more than welcome to check those out. But if I had to choose three, I would choose the three books of Eric Topol. <laughs> I guess he would be okay with that too. Um, Precious Obioyen, uh, here's a question you just asked. What do you feel is the most difficult thing at the moment in diabetes management, especially from the patient side? Diabetes might be the most exciting, if I can say exciting in this respect, medical conditions of all related to digital health. Because I think maybe diabetes patients are the patients being the most involved with their data and in their care. Because without them, without the proactive nature and approach, it's impossible to manage diabetes correctly. And with the, the introduction of artificial, the artificial pancreas systems, the first closed loop pancreas systems, um, all these efforts are great. But I think the biggest obstacle they face now, I, I think, is reflected uh, by the movement, the open APS movement. It's also called the, the VR not waiting movement. Those patients who, who wanted to create their own do-it-yourself bionic pancreas closed loop systems because technologically it's possible, but companies are selling the same technology at a great high price and they don't provide patients with all the data that I think they should receive. So this data privacy gap is one big obstacle and I have no doubts that patients will win this race or fight or battle at the end. And I totally understand patients who turn to their do-it-yourself technological solutions because when your your life or your family's family members' life lives are at stake, you don't wait for a company to get regulated when you know that technologically you could make it happen too. So this gap 
that is based on the high price companies give to their technologies, which patients can also make in some cases, and the regulatory hurdles about how slow regulations can be, I think these are the biggest hurdles for diabetes management. Uh, just for a second, I have to switch back to some, because I, I promised some people I, I would try to answer the questions they have. Leslie, Je Leslie Jamison sent a question before, a view primary care physicians still exist? And it sounds like it sounds like a funny question. It's 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 not funny. Um, there might be a notion that with all these technologies coming to our homes and patients becoming proactive, the primary care physicians will cease to exist. But that's that that couldn't be further from the case. I think instead the trend is that lifestyle medicine is becoming the most exciting medical specialty. Lifestyle medicine is is now becoming a real medical specialty and mostly, I guess, primary care physicians will be able to get that secondary medical specialty that focuses on all the dietary lifestyle changes from exercise to smoking, alcohol, anything you can think of that are related to lifestyle and can impact the development of lifestyle-related diseases, the biggest uh, group of diseases um, that as the lead of death. Uh, worldwide. So with la the introduction of lifestyle medicine, I think medical professionals, especially primary care physicians, will have a chance to thrive because finally they will have a chance to, to include both the use of technologies in their care and the chance that they can have a long-term impact on the lives of their patients. Phil Dowert sent a question before uh, that if I had a, if I launched a startup now, what kind of aspect I would focus on? Um, I would definitely, if I launch this right now, I would definitely focus on telemedicine, but, but, but I wouldn't focus on telemedical care in general. Instead, I would focus on something really specific, a specific patient group with special needs, um, a group of diabetes patients who use technologies, want them to be integrated into their care, something specific that general telemedical care services um, cannot meet. I think nobody can compete with those services in general, but by addressing these, these specified issues, I think I could have a, a business opportunity. So I would try to focus on, on that one. Lobby Sabi sent a question, quite a long one. We are in the process of building a new university hospital in Ghent, Belgium. And how do we look at consumer-based companies that are storming the market of healthcare? Do we need to have connectivity to their applications in combination with our electronic medical record systems? I think the best approach here could be patient design. So turning to those chronic patients who will use the hospital or our services and asking them what kind of technologies they would like to see getting integrated. Because if I base my decisions about how to build the technological structure of my hospital, on the marketing efforts of these consumer-based technological companies, it might be a bad direction, but by basing those decisions on what patients actually need, um, I cannot make a mistake here. So I would, I would uh, dive into that. Sabi Camacho sent a question about, can an obesity pandemic be associated with the pandemic going on right now? Um, absolutely. I, I, I don't think the lockdowns will result in that. Um, but I do believe that the obesity pandemic has been going on for at least a decade or so. And we have been knowing exactly based on a lot of studies, what kind of lifestyle choices people make uh, wrongly that lead to such, uh, such a pandemic. Uh, I think what the, how the, the COVID pandemic can make it worse is how these patients with dealing with obesity could get excluded from healthcare systems because of the focus and the healthcare capacity being dedicated to uh, COVID-19 patients first on the short term. On the long term, um, I guess they won't impact each other, uh, but the obesity pandemic is something that, that take many more lives than the COVID pandemic takes even in the next year or so. So going back to the live channel, um, I'm trying to catch as many questions as I can. How do you see, uh, Mombasha sent a question about how do I see, it's a long question. You you like long questions. So I have to try to shorten them all the time. The, the future relationship between pharma companies and reps and doctors and pharmacies. Um, I'm, I'm not very popular with this idea and opinion among pharma companies, but I, I don't think medical reps have a future here. Going to a physician's 
physical location, showing something, taking time from his or her, her, her time and, and work is something they don't need anymore. They can get the same information through interactive um, ways. It might be a strange idea. I think there is a bigger future for medical reps streaming such videos live and doing demonstrations for medical profession, many medical professionals at once, than going to physical locations one by one, knocking on their doors and sitting with them for a few minutes, trying to transmit a message or so why the physician is trying to do their job. I don't think that's 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 a strong future for medical reps. Um, Okay, the next question is from Christian Oswald. Wow, it's a, it's a hard question. Modern medicine is expensive. What can we do so that not only some of the wealthy can benefit from it? I guess by medicine you mean drugs, medications, not medical care uh, in general, because if it's medical care, one billion patients don't even have access right now to any medical care. So that, that would be one big change for them. Even a chatbot would be a big change for them. Not even I'm not even talking about having access to real medical professionals first. Second, in Rwanda, where there was no not enough money for creating a, a, a traditional healthcare system, they had to take a leap into digital health. So what they did was they reached out to companies with artificial intelligence, companies with medical drones, to make sure that they can deliver care even those areas which are really underdeveloped and patients don't have money for that in a traditional structure where patients have to travel to a point of care location and get treatment there, it wouldn't have been possible. But instead, they turned to telemedicine and now two thirds of patients in Rwanda have access to some kind of telemedical services, I think which is a really sustainable method for providing care, not only to the wealthy, but to anyone who, receive, who needs to receive medical care. All right. Going on, uh, there is a great question from Paolo Rovatti about patient monitoring for vital signs and biological parameters. Do you believe that the trend will be more to instrument the patient with variables and, and devices or more to instrument our environment, such as houses, workplaces, with touchless systems? I guess both, but if I had to assign a percentage to, to, the, to those two, I would assign 90% to the devices used by the patients and 10% to a smart house. I'm really a geek myself. The only technology I have is a, is a small device with which I can measure air quality uh, and um, humidity. Everything else I use is a device I can use, you know, in a portable way. And that's where I get my data from. So I guess patients will start, will keep on focusing on those devices more. Uh, Robert Kossel sent a question about if I, do, if I see a potential in mobile kiosk-like self-service diagnostic units. Um, it's, my, it's only my opinion. We've seen such kiosks in use before. Um, I'm, I'm, I haven't seen good ones so far. And knowing that I have a kiosk in my pocket, in my hand, that's not big enough. I, we don't need you know 5G for that. I think I can do the same kind of analysis with teledermatology, analyzing my skin lesions, my my eyesight with this device, ECG, all these vital signs with a smartphone compared to just sitting in, in a kiosk at a supermarket, which has to be, you know, always upgraded, which has to be sustained and developed. I don't know. I, I believe more in the notion of the, the technologies we already have rather than these large kiosks that uh, many companies have tried to deploy. Um, I don't think they have a big future. Um, wow, Moranike Akiniemi asked a really important question and one that is a really challenging one. Uh, what are the key areas to consider and assess to ensure appropriate ethics of digital health tools? Wow, plenty of things. First thing that every country regulatory agency must say out loud is that we have to empower patients. Patient empowerment is not an associated process in this digital health revolution. This is the thing everyone has to support as a government, medical professional, agency, pharma company, I don't care what. They must ensure that patients are being empowered 
And by being empowered, I mean that they do have choices and they can act on their own behalf while being involved in healthcare. The second thing is a privacy issue that it's impossible to solve that we use technologies, but without any privacy breaches, it's just in a utopia, it might happen, but not, but not in real life. I think the solution here is that as long as I'm the one deciding how much of my privacy I'm willing to give up in exchange for a chance for a long and healthy life, I'm should, I should be ethically okay. And the third one is how to deal with the, the underrepresented communities. And um, here, there are many topics we should discover. We should uh, cover here from mental health issues, uh, women, women health issues in technologies, um, artificial intelligence, bias in artificial intelligence, and how, because of how the algorithms are fed with faulty data, they can come up with the wrong conclusions, maybe excluding people of color from their results because the, the data they used uh, was not comprehensive enough. So this is, this is the, I think that's, maybe that might be the, the most challenging component. But if we just keep these three in mind, patient empowerment from the highest level, uh, the privacy issues as much as we can solve it, and dealing with underrepresented communities, I think we would do fine here uh, while implementing digital health solutions. All right, if we have time about one or two more questions. Uh, Gerard Finmore just asked this question. Small startups or big tech companies will bring more changes to healthcare. I, I love the question because a week ago, we came up with a, an update of our ebook, Tech Giants in Healthcare, in which we really laid out all the details, in-depth analysis about how the 15 major technology companies have been marching into healthcare. And while I think small startups can address the issues which are more specified to patient groups or, or, or the issues medical professionals face, I, I still think that tech giants can have a larger contribution because of the reach they have, the supply chains they have, and the technologies they produce that we like to use. So both will remain on the market. Small startups will focus on or should focus on more specified issues Why tech giants will keep on becoming healthcare companies or creating you know, collaborative efforts with healthcare companies themselves. And um, I'm so sorry, I, I really can't answer all the questions. I'm, I'm trying my best here. Maybe we have time for one more question. And first, I will answer everything else later. Plus, we will have more Q&As live soon. Um, how about this one? D. Seiler asked the advancements that I've seen in 3D printing pharmaceuticals. I, I got this, this package a while ago from a pharma company. It's called Zipdos. It's one of the first 3D printed um, medications, tablets. The, the reason why it's 3D printed is that it's used in epilepsy and it dissolves really fast because of the way it was 3D printed. I'm not saying that this is now something uh, every pharma company can use, but I'm saying that 3D printed drugs is now a reality. It's just a matter of time uh, before it becomes um, part of the pharmaceutical reality too. And if there is one company you should keep an eye on, it's FabRx, a company based in the UK. I think somehow they're always ahead of the other innovators and, and they are really pushing this and, and coming up with peer-reviewed studies and they communicate transparently about wh where this technology lies at the moment. So um, we just had a one hour long q and I, I really hope you, you found anything we discussed here interesting or useful. Uh, I, I'm sorry for those uh, I couldn't, for those who asked questions, but I couldn't answer those. I, I promise you I will answer everything later on, including those, the questions that were sent to us before uh, through eventbrite.com. And also uh, you can expect to have more sessions like this. Um, I love being a speaker and I think um, I, I do meet thousands of people every year and I have thousands of discussions with them and I really need to be involved and, and get real life questions and get challenged. So I think I, I have to thank you so much for taking part in this session. I hope you will take part in future sessions too. And in the meantime, you have to know that you can ask questions every day. That's why we are here for you on medicalfutures.com and all the channels we have on, on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Plus, I, I would like you to know that you can support what we do so we can keep on providing content for free on all these channels by becoming a patron on patreon.com. 
through which you could also get access to exclusive content nobody else receives from videos made for the patrons only podcast. And they also have live Q and A's, but only for them in a more um, private, more intimate way, talking about these issues that they are more interested in. But if you just become a supporter on patreon.com, it means that the, the whole, the magic future, future stream, uh, the team can work on and keep everything free on all the channels. So again, thank you so much for being here and talk to you soon in another stream. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.